This, in the hands of a physician, can be a serious threat to the security of some systems. In whatever way you're thinking that might be, you're probably wrong. The story comes from a hospital that installed these computers on wheels, essentially workstations that were on wheeled carts that you could move from room to room or bay to bay in a hospital. And physicians were leaving these logged in. Now there's a real security problem there because there's patient records that are visible. You potentially have access to prescriptions or even drugs themselves. So it's very important that only authorized people have access to these systems. The security solution that was proposed was that proximity sensors were put on these carts. So if the doctor walked away for a certain amount of time, they would automatically be logged out. This was so frustrating to physicians that they started putting styrofoam cups over the proximity detectors so it wouldn't know when they walked away. This actually made the system less secure. And the solutions that security people proposed to this problem included security monitors walking the hospital halls, removing the styrofoam cups, and on the technical side, building models of human frustration and exposure to log out behavior to optimize the time before the system logged them out. I can tell you exactly what went wrong with that system. Whoever designed the security did not take the couple days they should have to follow physicians and nurses around the hospital and see how they were using the carts. Because if a physician wheels that into a room, types in some information, and then goes to examine a patient, they shouldn't be logged out. And if they lose all the information they typed in, it's totally reasonable for them to get around the unreasonable security system. Instead, what we see so often in security is that the person who designs it sits in their office, comes up with how it probably should work and what they think is secure. They don't give any consideration to human workflows, tasks, or usability. And they impose this on people and expect them to conform. When people are reasonably trying to get their work done and the security system gets in their way, of course people try to get around it because it's stopping them from doing their job. And what we need to do is make sure that human workflows, capabilities, and tasks are incorporated into the security side to make things actually work. Let me give you another example of where this has failed, our pathetically insecure password systems. I'm supposed to create passwords that have no dictionary words, but that have uppercase, lowercase, numbers, punctuation, that are at least eight characters long, that don't repeat the same character multiple times, that don't repeat previous passwords I've used, I have to change them every six months, and I can't repeat them across the 200 or more places that I actually have passwords. Anyone who has the most basic understanding of human cognitive abilities knows that this is a ridiculous thing to ask people to do. But not only do we ask people to do it, but we get targeted with stories about how we're being insecure or stupid for creating simple passwords, or for not changing them enough, or for reusing them across sites. The field of human-computer interaction has spent decades learning how people think psychologically and cognitively, building models of that, and showing how that can be applied to the design of technology. We've built design methods that allow us to integrate people's tasks and feedback into the systems that we build. And we have lots of ways of evaluating systems for usability to see how well people can learn them, how well they remember how to use them, and how quickly and efficiently they can accomplish their tasks within those systems. Unfortunately, so much of cybersecurity has completely ignored all of what we know about human-computer interaction. And if any consideration is given to that, it's kind of tacked on the end. This is a burden that cybersecurity people are actually familiar with because a lot of times security is tacked onto a system after it's built. But if we want a secure system, the security and the human component needs to be integrated from the beginning. You can't build a security system unless you have talked to people, you understand what they're doing, and you arrange the security around helping them do their tasks. If the security gets in the way, it's totally reasonable that people are going to find ways around it so they can get their work done. If you design human users into the system from the beginning and build the security around what they're doing, your system ends up being more secure because people don't have to go around it. It works with them in parallel with their tasks. We see the same sorts of problems in privacy. We ran a simulation in my lab where we took a whole bunch of personal data points from Facebook, your name, your private messages, your favorite books, and we asked people to go through that list and check off what they thought apps like Candy Crush Saga or Farmville could access. Everybody underestimated how much data apps could access. And so as a second step, we had them view the Facebook privacy policy and data use policy. 
Or we had some people watch this interactive horror movie called Take This Lollipop that integrates data from your Facebook account that it accesses like an app and then shows this stalker tracking you down. The people who watched the video were significantly more informed afterwards about what data points apps could access than the people who read the data use policy. So this is a lot about how well we're conveying to people what the risks are with sharing their data and how they protect it. The same problems exist in privacy settings and security controls. They're just not designed for human users. It's extremely hard for people to figure out how to use them. And the same solutions that are available in HCI for security apply exactly in the same way to privacy. So what we're going to cover in this class are the basics of human-computer interaction. How do we understand people's cognitive and psychological abilities? How do we understand their tasks and what they're trying to do? and then look at methods of designing that into systems and evaluating how well the systems do. We'll then take those lessons and examine all kinds of different security and privacy problems from authentication to social media privacy settings. So we can see how you as a designer can build in understandings of humans to make systems that are ultimately more secure. Let's start by learning what human-computer interaction is. Human-computer interaction, which we commonly abbreviate as HCI, is the study of how people interact with technology. Those people can be your average user working with a desktop or laptop computer, but they can also be people on the move using mobile devices like smartphones and tablets, or even people using sensors like a Fitbit to measure how they interact with the world. In HCI, we want to understand the people, the technology, and how the two fit together. From the people perspective, we want to understand both the psychological and cognitive abilities of users. This allows us to build technology that takes advantage of people's inherent abilities and also that avoids overtaxing people by requiring them to do things that they're not cognitively capable of or that are difficult. On the technology side, HCI speaks to both design and evaluation of technology. We use what we know about people, the tasks, and the way they're interacting with systems to design technology that will work well for them. And we also evaluate how well that technology works to make sure we've done it right. Overall, our goal is to make sure that people aren't working any harder than necessary to use the technology that we've designed. So we start off wanting to understand users, tasks, and the context in which people are performing those tasks in a system. The users can be anyone from children up to elderly adults, and it can be people working alone or working in teams, whether it's pairs or large groups. The tasks are things that people are trying to accomplish with a system. It can be something as easy as logging in to something as complex as analyzing a large data set. Tasks are not necessarily intuitive to understand and we'll have a whole segment dedicated to building a list of tasks for users. And finally, we want to understand context. Even if we have the same users and same tasks, how they're performing those and where they're doing them can dramatically affect the systems we build. For example, if we have a soldier trying to secure a system, it makes a big difference if he's doing that in an office environment or if he's out working in the field. Once we understand users, tasks, and context, then we move into design. This is where we're building technology that considers everything we know about people and what they want to do. And hopefully we're going to build a system that makes it as easy as possible for people to accomplish those tasks. Finally, there's an evaluation step. And in looking at usable security, this is not evaluation of the system's security, but evaluation of how easy it is for people to use that system. If it's too difficult for people, they'll simply find ways around the security or make insecure decisions. So we want to evaluate our systems to make sure that they're easy for people to use. This is how HCI applies to usable security, and we'll now start looking at some more detailed elements of HCI and what it can help us understand.
Usability lies at the heart of usable security. It's a way that we can measure and understand how easy it is for people to use a system. In this lecture, we'll learn the elements of usability and the different ways we can measure those. When we're measuring usability, there are five main factors we consider. Speed, efficiency, learnability, memorability, and user preference. It's possible to have good usability on some of these factors, but not all of them. Occasionally there's a trade-off, but what we want to do is be able to look at all five and make the system as usable among as many of these features as possible. Speed is a way of measuring how quickly a user can accomplish the task. We generally measure this by timing how long it takes them to complete it, and we ignore mistakes in this, so we assume the users are acting in an optimal way and not making a lot of mistakes. Here, we'll conduct a test to see if it's faster to log into an iPhone using the thumbprint recognition system or a four-digit code to authenticate. Ready? Go! So we can see it took one second to log in using the thumbprint identifier, but 4.8 seconds to log in with the four-digit code. Thus, the thumbprint wins. Efficiency measures how many mistakes are made in accomplishing the task. So someone might be able to accomplish a task very quickly, but also make a lot of mistakes along the way. Sometimes there's a trade-off between speed and efficiency. For example, if we think about typing, someone may type at a normal rate of 60 words per minute, but we could increase that and have them type at a rate of 120 words per minute. Their speed would certainly increase, but they would be likely to make more mistakes along the way, so the efficiency would decrease. If we want to measure the efficiency of something like the iPhone login system, we would count errors on the thumbprint recognition system as times when the thumb is put down but it's not properly recognized. This will show a try again message at the bottom of the screen. Similarly, for the four digit code entry, we would look at how many times the user enters the wrong code or makes a typo while entering the code. Learnability is a feature that tells us how easy it is for a user to learn to use the system. This lets us know how well someone can come into the system for the first time and get up and running with it. Ideally, they would need very little instruction and be able to find the features that they need quite quickly. On the iPhone, when a user turns the screen on, if they don't do anything for a couple seconds, the slide to unlock message appears at the bottom. If the user slides their thumb over that, they get the keypad entry. This makes the learnability quite straightforward for learning to do the four-digit code entry. However, there's nothing to tell the user to put their thumb on the pad to enter the system that way, so the learnability for the thumbprint system without instruction is lower. Memorability extends learnability. Once a user has learned how to use the system, memorability tells us how easy it is for them to remember how to use it. So if they've stopped using the system for a while and they come back, is it likely that they quickly remember how to use it, or do they need to practice and relearn some of the features? We'll take a bit of a diversion here from our iPhone authentication example to look at something else, a font system. This is a little preview of how these measures of usability can play into the design of a system. We're going to do a whole separate lecture on design, but this is a little hint of how the things are connected. In this case, we have a font system. We want users to be able to come in, pick some different fonts, and see what they look like. This helps them learn the name of the fonts and what they look like. They can try it a few times and then they'll get a good sense. But, if the font eventually gets changed to something strange, and the user comes back, or they remember that they want to use a different font, you shouldn't force them to remember the name of the fonts they learned. If you can aid them by both showing what those fonts are, and not just forcing them to remember by name, it becomes a much easier task for users to remember how to use the system. And the final usability feature is user preference, which is what do users like most. Ideally, users will prefer a system that's faster, easier to learn, and that allows them to make fewer mistakes. 
That's not always the case. Sometimes we could build a system that has good speed, efficiency, learnability, and memorability, but the users prefer it less than a system that has worse usability on all the other measures. This has actually happened. There's an example from an older paper from the University of Maryland where users were shown two map systems. The first one, shown here, has an overview window in the corner, in this case showing a map of the state of Washington, with a little context window that shows what's zoomed in in the main part of the screen. This is one of the interfaces users were given, and the other interface would start with the full state zoomed out like this, and users could actively zoom in much like you can do with Google Maps now. Users were given a set of tasks to do with these maps, their speed and efficiency were measured, and the users were also given a questionnaire to fill out at the end to indicate their preferences. The zooming map scored better on speed and better on efficiency, but in terms of user preference, they preferred the overview with the small context window. There's no good guideline about which feature to choose in this case. There's simply a trade-off. The users preferred the overview even though they were slower and they made more mistakes. It's really up to the system designer to figure out in cases like this if we want to pick one system over the other or if there might be a way of combining features to give users an option or the ability to have some of the preferred features with some of the benefits of the other system. The next question then is how do we measure these? Sometimes that's straightforward. With speed, we measure it by timing how long it takes someone to complete a task. For efficiency, we count the number of errors that a person makes, and we may rate those errors in terms of their severity. A simple typo may be a less severe error than something a user does that causes the whole program to shut down, losing their work and forcing them to start over. But what about learnability, memorability, and user preference? Those don't have a measure that's as straightforward as timing the user completing a task or counting the number of errors. For learnability, we often look at how long it takes a user to learn to use the system. So we have a chart here where we would measure how long it takes a user to log in, and we have a series of login attempts across the bottom. The first login may take them 10 seconds, the second may take more like 5 seconds, the third two and a half seconds, and so on until by the end the amount of time it takes them is leveling off. This chart gives us a sense of how long it takes people to learn and a sense of the learning curve. We could have a system that looks like this, but we could also have a system where for many login attempts it takes a long time until finally something clicks and the users are able to quickly complete the task. To measure memorability, we can start off the same way and then wait a long time. Have the user come back and use the system and see how long it takes them to log in then. It could take a really long time, in which case we have bad memorability, or they could log in as quickly as the last time they used the system, which means the system has good memorability. It's likely that we may have a value somewhere in between where after a long break the users may need a little more time to re-familiarize themselves with the system, but hopefully they're not returning to a level of ability with the system as poor as when they were first learning how to use it. And then finally we want to measure user preference. This is something that we do either with questionnaires and surveys. There are many standard questionnaires and surveys for measuring user preference on a variety of systems. And so those are things that you can give to users. They rate things on a scale usually from 1 to 5 or 1 to 7. And then you can actually compute between two systems which ones the users prefer more. And conducting interviews where you actually sit down, talk to users as they're using the system, and have them explain what things they like and what they don't can give you much deeper insight into users' preferences and how usable the system feels to them. Tasks are goals that users set out to accomplish when they're using a system. Analyzing the usability of a system requires a set of tasks because usability of a system as a whole is a concept that's too abstract to be understood. Instead, we want to come up with specific goals that users want to accomplish and then analyze the usability of those goals or tasks. This gives us an insight into what the system is good at and where it needs work. 
Tasks should be specific things that an average user would set out to do, and some of them will be more important than others. It's important to consider that ranking when you're putting tasks together. So you should have a set of most important tasks and less important tasks to give you a set of what can be done in the system. Before we get into any of the specifics of creating a list of tasks, let's look at the Google website as an example. What are the tasks that one might accomplish on the Google site? First, they might conduct a web search. And the site is set up well for that because the main thing you see on the home page is this search box that searches the web. What are other things a user might want to do on the site? Well, they might be interested in doing a different kind of search. And so if we scan the site, we clearly see an image search up at the top and another box here, which gives us access to different Google services. We can also log in, and not only is the login clearly available, it's set up in a way that it's not distracting to people who just want to search because they're clearly drawn to the box in the middle. But also, the login is placed up in the upper right-hand corner, which is a common place for login spaces to be. Thus, it's relying on things users already know about a website. We may also want to look at information about advertising or terms of service, and that can again easily be found here at the bottom of the screen. If someone's looking for it, there's not a lot of clutter on the page and so it's easy to find, but it's unobtrusive so it's not in the way of something other users would be doing. Settings are also located on the bottom which give users access to other features like doing an advanced search, looking at their history, or getting help. All in all, the usability of the website is very high because the most important tasks are the most obvious thing on the page. The secondary tasks are placed in obvious places based on what users are used to in other sites. And if we made a full list of tasks, it's likely that we would find a way to accomplish all of those quite easily on the main page, even though nothing is in the way of users accomplishing a basic task like a search. Tasks themselves are goals that users set out to accomplish in a system. And it's important to put your head in the mind of the user and think about the kinds of things they want to do as you're creating a list of tasks for your system. Here are some example tasks. One is log into Facebook. This is something that a user will intentionally set out to do. They'll go to the Facebook website with the intention of logging in. There's a lot of things that they might do after that, but logging in is a small and concrete task that they might set out to accomplish. Another example is to check your credit card statement. And this is a higher level task in one sense, in that it has many subparts. The user will need to go to the credit card website, log in, and potentially click on a few links in order to get to the statement itself. So even though there are subparts of this task, we want to think about what the user's goal is. And though the user may understand those subparts, their ultimate goal is to check the statement. And so that becomes our task. In a further lecture, we'll look at how we want to break tasks down into subparts and how that relates to users' abilities and the way they think about systems. But for now, understanding and identifying this general goal of checking the statement is the right level to be at. A final example is to read the headlines. A user can pick any news website to do this, and they may have to do some subtasks. Some websites may require them to log in, others may require them to click some links, but ultimately the goal of reading the headlines is something the user will set out to do, and they may figure out the steps that they need to do in order to accomplish that. When we measure the usability of a particular task, we rely on the five factors that we discussed in a previous lecture. We look at measuring speed, efficiency, learnability, memorability, and user preference. We discussed how to measure these in the previous lecture, but let's revisit one example. Recall our task of authenticating in to use the iPhone, and that can be done either with the thumbprint authentication or by entering the four-digit code. Those are two methods of accomplishing the same task, and so we can analyze the usability of those methods by applying the five factors that we previously discussed to how the user carries out each method to authenticate.
So recall that we start off by holding the phone. It takes about one second to authenticate with the thumbprint, and it took about four seconds to authenticate using the four second code entry. Since there were no mistakes made, efficiency is equivalent between the two systems, but speed is faster with the thumbprint. Thus, there's higher usability for this task. There are common errors that beginners often make when they're creating a list of tasks for their website or their system. One is that their tasks can be too leading or too descriptive. For example, you might create a task that says something like, click on the username box at the upper right of the screen and enter your username, then click the password box underneath it and enter your password and click submit. Essentially, this is a list of instructions for the user, but the user doesn't set out with the goal in mind of doing each of these things. They set out with a higher level goal of logging in, and they may come up with this set of steps along the way. If you're creating a system, since you won't be giving users this set of instructions as they use it, you don't want that to be your task. Think about the goal the user has in mind, which is simply logging in, and that should be the task. It shouldn't have the extra detail. Another common error is asking specific questions. For example, what's the third headline on CNN.com? While a user certainly might read the third headline on CNN.com, they don't generally go to the site specifically looking for what the third headline is. Thus, this is far too specific. Users may go to read the headlines, and in fact, they might even go to read the first headline only. But the third is a very specific and unusual thing that doesn't have any meaning on its own. And when people are starting off, they sometimes come up with really specific tasks like this. But this isn't a reasonable goal that a user would have, and so we don't want to stick to that as a task. And one final common error is that people who create systems often put in information that isn't something that users are necessarily going to seek out, but they'll create tasks to point users to that information. For example, you may ask as a task, what are the names of the members of the website security team? But in most instances, people aren't visiting websites or using systems to find out the members of the security team. They're going there to check their balance if it's a website for a bank, to read the headlines if it's a news website, or to see what their friends have been up to if it's social media. While there may be an occasional user who wants to know the members of the security team, it's a very rare task. and often is something that the developers put in because they care about it, not because the users care about it. So be careful in creating tasks that you're not simply directing people to information that you want them to look at. It should be something that users intentionally want to see. One thing that we can do is to compare tasks between systems. So we have the same task for a user to accomplish, but a couple ways of doing it. Here, let's look at an example task of giving people right access to a file. In this case, we're talking about people broadly, so we want everyone to have right access to a file. And we're going to look at two ways of doing this, one on the command line and one in a graphical user interface. The command line is quite fast if you know what you're doing, but if you don't know Unix commands, you have to look them up, scroll through the documentation, and hope to find what you're looking for. It's not an easy process and not an easy way to learn. So this is a system that's very good for experts, but if you're not an expert, reading and learning is extremely difficult, and it will take you quite a long time to figure out how to do the task. Thus, the usability is high for experts, but low for beginners. On the other hand, the graphical user interface is extremely simple. You can click on an option, select Read Access, and you're done. What if we change that task just slightly to have us give everyone execute permission instead of read permission? This task is similarly reasonable. It's something that you would do just as often. But we actually see big differences in which system is more usable and more effective for this variant of the task. In this case, the command line is equally complicated. There's the same command issued with a slight tweak, and it achieves the goal of adding execute access. However, the command line doesn't have an option to add execute access. So even though it's simple, it's not able to achieve the task we care about here. So to wrap up, tasks are goals that users have when interacting with the system. To evaluate the usability of a system, we can create a representative list of tasks 
and evaluate the usability of those tasks according to the factors that we discussed previously. When designing interactive systems, one of the most important human characteristics that we have to take into account is memory. Humans' memory has particular limits and capabilities, and if we understand this from a cognitive perspective going into our design, we can build systems that take advantage of people's capabilities instead of taxing them. The part of memory that's particularly of interest when you're building a system for people is working memory. This is sometimes called short-term memory, and it's the part of our memories where we store information that we readily need to access in a quick amount of time. George Miller in 1956 wrote a paper that he called The Magical Number, where he theorized that working memory could hold seven plus or minus two pieces of information. The most capable people could remember up to nine things at once, and those on the lower end of the spectrum could remember five. That number has been revised. Broadbent in 1975 suggested the range was more like four to six. Le Compote in 1999 said that if you're designing systems for people to use, you really shouldn't ask them to remember more than three things at a time. And a common practice that we see in user interface design is requiring people to remember four plus or minus one things, so three to five. Let's look at some examples of what working memory means, and we'll do this in the context of a concept called chunking. If I give you this string of characters and ask you to put it in your working memory, that means you'd be able to look at the screen, look at the letters for a few seconds, and then leave the room and write them down on a piece of paper. Now this string of characters is 10 long, which exceeds even Miller's plus or min 7 plus or minus 2 example. It's hard to remember. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's 10 different characters for us to remember. And so it's unlikely that a lot of us would be able to look at this for a few seconds, turn away from the screen, and write down exactly what we saw. But we could rearrange these characters. They can be rearranged to spell old veg me yo, or video Jim lo. In this case, we have the same ten characters, but we have it in four or three words. Because we can remember the word old as a single thing, we're not really remembering three characters in terms of our working memory. We're remembering one word. So we've rearranged these characters into chunks that can be remembered more easily. This concept of chunking explains that working memory can hold seven plus or minus two or four to six things, but if you can group things into meaningful chunks, you can remember seven plus or minus two chunks or four to six chunks as opposed to individual atomic elements. So doing old veg me yo is four words that we have to remember, which is a lot easier than ten characters. We could take this even one step further. These same characters can be arranged to spell I love my dog. Now that's a phrase that makes sense. It's a sentence that we've all probably heard before, and it's something that we can remember almost as a single unit. We're remembering the phrase, I love my dog, which is easier than remembering three or four distinct words that don't have a lot of coherent meaning. But even those three or four words are easier to remember than the ten characters. In all these cases, we're remembering the same ten characters, but they're put into different chunks that tax our working memory in different ways. So remembering a single phrase is almost like remembering one item as opposed to remembering ten individual characters. Another example could be this. These are the digits of pi. And at one point in my life I decided I needed to learn a bunch of digits of pi. And I think I had memorized out to about a hundred digits, which was pretty good. I can't remember that many anymore. This is what I can remember. So that's still a lot more than the average person, but I'm not going to win any Pi recitation contests with these characters. But if we wanted to set out to memorize this string of numbers, how would we do it? One of the first steps we can do is to break this down. So we have 3.14. That's the estimate of Pi that we all learned like in elementary school. And then we have everything that comes after it. So the everything that comes after it is really the hard part. And when I was memorizing this, I would break it up into small pieces. And this is about how I have it memorized in chunks that look like this. 159, 26, 535, 8979, and so on. 
If you count these, there's actually eight chunks here, which fits nicely in Miller's seven plus or minus two emphasis. Now, I've got these numbers committed to my long-term memory at this point, but the fact that I was able to remember about eight chunks frequently enough that I could commit it to long-term memory is a good sign of how those limits apply. I had the rest of the numbers broken into chunks as well, and at one point I did have them memorized, but that's kind of faded away. The first eights were the easiest to remember. So what I'd like to do now to get us thinking about this idea of what our own limits are of our short-term memories and how chunking works is to have you do some exercises. Here's an example. We're going to flash a number up on the screen. It's going to stay there long enough for you to read it and then it'll go away. When it disappears, you should have a piece of paper in front of you and write down the number that you'd seen. We're going to do some real exercises. So you can pause the video here, go get yourself a piece of paper and a pencil, and don't cheat. So let the number show up on the screen and then disappear, and only after it disappears should you write the number down on the piece of paper. Don't pause the video, don't cheat. The point here is to test your working memory. We're going to go through a series of numbers, and I want you to write them down. There's going to be a slide in between that indicates when we're going on to the next number. Some of them will be really long numbers, and some of them will be broken up into chunks where each chunk is shown in series. Write them all down, and when we get to the end, I'll show the solutions and you can see how well you did. Longer numbers will appear for a longer amount of time, so you will always have time to read the full number, sometimes even twice. And then when the screen goes blank and the number disappears, it's set up so you have plenty of time to write the number down before the next thing appears. So you shouldn't feel too rushed in this exercise. So pause it here, and when you're ready, come back and hit play, and we'll get started. Ready? Go.
So now let's check your answers. Here's the first set of numbers that we looked at. I've broken these up into groups of three exactly because it's easier to compare something you have written down to something on the screen when they're in small chunks. Hopefully you notice that the first set of numbers are the same but in the second example I grouped them like a phone number and that makes it easier to chunk them even though you're remembering exactly the same numbers. Remembering them as pieces of a whole often makes it easier. So perhaps you got more right in the second example than you did in the first. The rest of the numbers that you saw were exactly the same length. Some of them you saw as one string, some of them you saw broken up into groups of five, and others you saw broken up into groups of three. Hopefully you're able to compare your numbers here and see that you probably did better when the numbers came up in groups of three. Here's the remaining answers. And if you notice, the last set of numbers that you went through, you probably picked up on it as you were going through. They were in more memorable groups. So the first set you can see here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The other groups didn't follow exactly the same pattern, but they were in groups that were relatively easy to find patterns in, and that may have made it easier for you to remember them. So the idea to take out of this exercise is that giving people small groups of things to remember as part of their tasks makes it much easier because our working memory does not accommodate large strings, whether it's numbers, text, or other things to remember. Smaller bits are easier for people to work with, and that's a lesson that we'll carry forward as we talk about designing usable systems. So how do we use chunking when making usable security decisions? Well, let's consider passwords for an example. This is a list of the top 10 most popular passwords that are used. And anyone who has spent time learning about secure passwords, and even people who haven't, know that these are not secure passwords. But they're easy passwords to remember. Some of them actually look like the numbers I had you doing in the experiment that we just finished. Other ones are words, and there's a couple combination of words in there, but all of these are really easy to remember. That's not how most password systems advise us to create them. There's big, long, complicated rules of how many characters and what kinds of characters can go in a password, what characters can't, how often you can repeat it. There's rules about changing your password every few months that drive me crazy. There's recommendations that you don't repeat your passwords across sites. And so what this means is if you have 200 sites with passwords, which you might, I certainly do, and you're supposed to change those passwords every six months, and you can't repeat passwords across sites, plus you have this big list of rules, it means that people either pick insecure passwords or if they try to follow these rules, they have a post-it or something with the passwords written down. This isn't a secure system. But it's because the rules for creating passwords, where you need eight characters with an upper, a lower case, a number, a special character, and so on, doesn't rely on people's cognitive abilities. Those sorts of passwords are hard to remember. But research has shown that you can create passwords that take advantage of chunking and humans' memory capabilities. You create a password with chunks. So for example, people were advised to pick two meaningful dates and two meaningful initials to them to pick a character that separated parts of the date and create a password. So here's an example of one of those. The first part of this, 81171, is a date, as is 121181. The first one is followed by the initials LG, and the second is followed by the initials KD. This is a super secure password. It meets all of the rules that most of these systems require. And in fact, it's much longer and much more secure. But it's very easy for a person to remember. They just need to recall those two important dates and the two initials that they picked. Researchers have actually studied this. And when they asked people to create a standard seven character password on three different sites, 50% of the time people could remember the password that they created. When they asked people to create a four chunk password like this, it has two chunks as dates and two chunks as initials, they created four chunk passwords on three sites, they were able to recall it 76% of the time. So not only does chunking allow us to advise people on how to create passwords that they remember more easily, they also create passwords that are more secure because they're longer and have more characters in them. 
So this is a great example of how we can take advantage of this cognitive ability of chunking that people have and apply it to a security principle like password creation to create systems that are both more usable and more secure. We'll talk more about passwords later on in this course and how to create usable ones. And we'll also look at how chunking appears in a lot of other examples as we discuss usable security. Mental models are an important part of usability. They let us understand how users perceive systems, and if we keep that in mind when we're designing a system, it can improve usability in all the aspects that we've discussed. Users of a system didn't write the code and generally weren't involved in the design process, so when they come in to use a piece of software, they generally don't know how it works. Yet, oftentimes people are able to sit down and immediately begin using a piece of software. When they do this, they're relying on mental models. This borrows knowledge from all other parts of their life, including experience in the outside world and with other software they've used. They have those models that they apply to the current piece of software that they're using, and they can rely on their expectations and previous experience to help guide them through using the software. If we can take these mental models into account when we're designing software, we can build things in that make it easier for users to learn to use the software, to remember how to use it, and as they're interacting with it, they can be faster, more efficient, and more confident. In short, usability improves all the way across the system. There are a number of factors that play into developing mental models, which we'll look at today. First are affordances. Affordances are things within a system that show a user how they're supposed to be used. There are a couple components that are important to consider as part of affordances. Mapping, visibility, and feedback. Let's look at each of those individually. Mapping discusses how certain functionalities will map to something that you see. If we think about a stove that you may have in your house, you have four burners on it and you have four knobs. Each knob turns on a burner. But which knob turns on which burner? Ideally, we would want a mapping that says which burner the leftmost knob goes to, which burner the rightmost knob in this pair goes to, and so on. This current setup that we're looking at here probably indicates to us that these two knobs go to the two burners on the left, and these two control the two burners on the right. So there's some affordance there. There's some mapping. But we don't really know which of these knobs turns on which burner, the front or the back. We could redesign this layout so that there's a better mapping. One simple way to do this would be to change the configuration of the knobs entirely. Here it's very clear that the lowermost knob controls the lower burner, the top knob controls the top burner, and the left group controls the left burners, the same for the right. This is a big change in the size of the system, so maybe there's a way that we can alter the layout of the knobs so that there's a good mapping. One way to do that could be to have them similar to how they were at first, but to have two of the knobs placed closer to the back and two closer to the front. This gives a pretty good indication that the two center knobs are controlling the two back burners since they're further back. But the mapping would be even clearer if there was a match between the layout of the knobs and the layout of the burners. Here, we've moved the two back burners closer together, so it's quite clear that that matches the layout of the two rear knobs. This is a way that we can do mapping. We want there to be a clear correspondence between the controls and the result that will come from using them. Cars are a classic example of where there's a very clear mapping between the controls and the functionality. So if I'm driving and I want to turn the car left, it makes sense for me to turn the wheel to the left. I'm turning the wheel in the same direction I want the car to go. I turn right to make the wheels go right. If I want to use the turn signal, it follows the same direction as the steering wheel. If I want to turn left, I hit the signal down, which is the same direction I would turn the wheel if I were going left. If I want to go right, I move the signal up which is the same direction I would turn the wheel if I were turning right.
As we've discussed before, Google does a great job of making its functionality visible in a usable way. The most visible thing is the task people want to do most often, which is to do a search. On top of that, other things people want to do are also visible on the page, but they don't clutter up the main task. So advertising, business, and about pages are clearly visible, but they're hidden away down at the bottom. Anyone who's looking would likely head to this area to try to find it, but it won't get in the way of someone who's not interested in finding that. The same thing is true over here with privacy and terms. Again, those are normally at the bottom. They're visible for someone who's looking for them, but it's not going to get in the way of the major tasks that someone else is trying to accomplish. This e-commerce site illustrates some feedback. Here we're looking at a t-shirt, and if I want to order it in a small, I can see that that size is grayed out. If I put my mouse over it, I get feedback on top of the picture that says this is not available in the size that you're looking for. And if I click on the size small, it grays out the color options that aren't available, in this case the white one up at the top. Constraints talk about how a system can prevent us from doing things that we shouldn't and how the design of it can encourage us to do things the right way. Let's look at an example. The classic example of a physical constraint is what you get with a plug. It's difficult to get confused about which orientation to use since it's very clear where the slot is. Furthermore, if we have different sized prongs, one slot is too small, so we know we're constrained and have to turn it around. On this page, we have a login window. It asks for the email address and the password, and there's a sign in button. Now, it is obvious that I should enter a password, but I can click sign in without typing it in, and then I get an error asking me to please provide my password. This is okay, but there are better ways to do this. Specifically, we can incorporate a constraint. For example, if we pick a Wi-Fi network, we're prompted to enter a password, but the join button doesn't appear until the password has been typed in. So we can enter a password, and only when it's long enough do we have the option to click the join button. That's creating an affordance and a constraint so I know that I can't even try to join until I've typed the password in. Conventions describe a common understanding of what something means. These can be cultural or relatively universal. When we're looking at software, we've often seen traffic metaphors creep in. For example, stoplights are used in a lot of countries. Red always means stop, and it's almost always on the top. Green means go, and it's almost always on the bottom. Traffic signs are also used. The yield or alert sign often is yellow, triangle-shaped, and is very common across cultures, as is the red circle with a diagonal slash that indicates you should not do what it is that you're trying to do. Because these are well known across cultures, they're easy to use in software because we can expect users understand the conventional meaning of these symbols and they can incorporate it into their mental model of how the system works. Let's see that working in software. If I go to the Pandora website, it starts playing a radio station for me. Now there's a set of controls across the top, and we're really expecting the user to know what those controls are. There's this button in the middle, which we're trained to know means pause, though it doesn't say pause, but it works. If we see the triangle, we know it means play. There's a thumbs up and a thumbs down to the left, which again, we're in cultured to know means that we're voting a song up or down. Now the timeline at the bottom may give us a way to fast forward or rewind, but clicking there doesn't seem to do anything. In this case, our expectation wasn't met. The volume works as expected, and the skip option with the two triangles in the line does in fact skip us to the next song. This relies on conventions for controlling music that are well understood by users. So to come back to mental models, they're really a combination of labels which can be put into the system to explain what's going on but more than that affordances which help a user figure out what to do constraints which prevent them from doing the wrong thing mappings between the controls and the actual functionality conventions that users have come to expect from controls and system interaction if we put all these things together along with our understanding of users experiences both in general, outside in the world, and with software, 
It can help us better understand what the user will expect when they come in to use the system and how we can design it to be more usable and, eventually for our concerns, more secure.